for that. So I'm going to intro introduce the, um, the paper of today that is basically addressing whether surgical masks can prevent viral spread. Um, so they are, um, the panelists already introduced, introduced me, but for whoever was not paying attention, my name is Francisca, so I come from Santiago, Chile. So this is a very small and like it's big but a narrow country in the tip of South America, around here. And you can see here, this is a picture of one of the national parks uh, over there. So we have plenty of volcanoes, lakes, and greenery. It's really nice. So whenever there are flies to go there again, you can take a beautiful vacation down there if you have the time and the money. So I normally, I came, so I came here to New York to study, to do my PhD at the Rockefeller University. And I normally, and I work, I specialize in neuroscience. So my day to day is working with mice and basically studying their brains and understanding how the neurons in their brains work. So neurons are the cells that are like in, inside the brain that execute all these amazing functions that led to our behavior and the, and, and of e every animal. So normally what I do is just I have a microscope and I try to look at the neurons and understand what is it that they are doing that are making the animal think, move, and make a decision. But today we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what is important now, which, co which is COVID-19 and related topics. So just to be clear, I'm not a virologist. I'm not an immunologist. I'm not an expert in any means. I'm just a scientist who happens to be able to read papers and communicate a little bit of this information to everybody, everyone. So uh, to start with, normally, so what do we mean by scientific literature? Normally, when, by example, when I do my research, I have to then, uh, I have to find something, like I have a hypothesis that I'm going to sort of address, and then with a set of experiments, trying to answer and reach to a conclusion. And once I do that, I'm going to publish this into a scientific journal. So I'm going to write it down. I'm going to be very specific about the topic, the methods, and all the techniques that I'm using, and, the re and report all my data. And this is the proper way to do it. But the problem is that it is very specific. It has a lot of difficult words that normally this is the kind of literature that only goes to my peers, fellow scientists, and it doesn't go to regular people. OK? And this is, so normally scientific literature, you can find it in two forms. The most common one that we all rely on is the ones that is peer review. This means that once I have my, my paper basically written, I send it to a journal that is gonna send it to three or four different scientists who work in the field, but are not related to my work. They're gonna read it go through it in an analytical, with an analytical perspective and then uh, basically make sure that everything I'm doing is, is correct, everything I'm showing makes sense, and it's, it, it basically follow the gold standards to ensure that, it's, that it's, it has quality and rigor and you are not falsifying any data. But also you can, I can, one other thing that I can do with my my research is to upload it to the web, to specific uh, websites, and have a preprint version, which is basically the same version that I send the peer review, review with reviewers, but this one has not been peer reviewed yet. So these people have not correct or have not uh, questioned my research. It's just directly there what I think over there in the web. So right now in the COVID world, because things are moving very fast and there are a lot of scientists working together to try to gather as much, much information about the virus as possible. Then people put in the, in the preprint world, so, people, so we have access to this knowledge while it's being peer reviewed. So this doesn't mean that you don't do the peer review, it just means that you collect the data, you have the data available a little bit faster. But today's paper is actually a paper that already has gone through the process of peer review, so we don't have to worry about some maybe inconsistencies and um, some kind of like bad quality of the research. So this is how the paper looks like. 
you can see here, um, this is the title, which is Respiratory Viruses Shedding in Exhaled Breath and Efficacy of Face Mask. So, and these, all these people are the ones that work together in order to bring this research into one and make it available to all of us. So most of, the, like, most of this work was done, was done in Hong Kong, right here. In the, in, in the south of China, in two different in hospitals and institutions, in collaboration with institutions here in the US. So this is an, one example of how basically science is an international collaboratory, collaboratory environment. So you can see that we don't, normally scientists don't care about borders or uh, boundaries in ethnicity or locations. We normally if we need to work together to make things happen, we do it, okay? And why is this paper, why is this research important? And I think it's very important because if you see all over the news, for example, here in the Washington Post, you have articles saying like, should, we, should Americans wear masks? Will they wear masks? What is the purpose of wearing masks? In the, in the UK, the Guardian was also saying like, it was also posting the information that the government is, forced, is enforcing people to wear masks. Here in New York City, we also uh, have to wear masks in public spaces. For example, in Walmart, which is one of the biggest in New York, um, biggest US employees, employers is gonna make all their employees wear masks when they go to work. So this is, these are like a lot of measures that are taking different governments and entities in order to prevent the virus from spreading. Even if you see here, there's a, like news from, from home where they're saying like you have to wear masks when you are in public spaces. So this is not only happening in the US, it's all over the world. But to make these decisions for politicians and public health specialists to make this decision, they have to have data that supports um, the policy. Otherwise, it can, it can get into a very nasty territory or Forcing, enforcing people to do something that is not actually worth it. So, it can, so that's why we need papers like this and science like this in order to drive or mainly public health and, and public policy. Well, so to introduce you to the research, I'm gonna first talk about four key terms that are necessary to know in order to understand the research the method, the methodology, and the results that you get. Um, the first one is respiratory viruses. So I think now we, all, we are all well, well aware there are respiratory viruses. M many of them, the ones that are gonna uh, study here are the ones that cause acute respiratory illness, ARIs. So these are basically the ones that cause the common cold during the winter that we all get at one point of another. So here we're gonna introduce three different viruses. The first one is sort of like a classic influenza virus, which is the one that causes the flu. We all get a, most of us get a, get a flu shot at the beginning of the winter in order to prevent this virus to, to infect us and make us sick. The other one that is a, the most common uh, respiratory virus out there is this rhinovirus. So whenever you have the common cold and, and like a runny nose, you have rhinovirus. This is a classic one. It's not that, deep, deep, uh, that dangerous, but uh, it comes in all different forms. And we have the third one that we are all very much familiar now with the coronaviruses. So this is the one, this is the kind of virus that now is affecting us during the pandemic uh, outbreak. So you can see here, these are pictures of the three different kind of viruses. And these are pictures taken by electron micrographs. So basically you have a super microscope that allows you to see these very, very, very tiny particles. And as a side note, I have to say that most, if not all of these pictures come, were taken around in the 70s by an by a technique that was developed by a scientist called June Almeida. So June Almeida was basically the pioneer in viral imaging. So she was born in 1964. 
uh, I mean, sorry, she in 1954 was the first one to identify human coronaviruses. So this is the first picture that she took and was able to see a coronavirus. So you can see clearly this virus here that has this crown around la corona, no? And, and thanks to her, we know that this virus actually exists in the first place. And it's funny because when she sent her paper to be peer reviewed, the reviewer said that this was actually just influenza virus with bad resolution, that she messed up with the technique. And then she had to basically further prove and validate that this was another type of virus. It was not the influenza virus. So she was born in, in Glasgow, in Scotland, and actually left school when she was 16 and started working in a laboratory as a laboratory technician. And since then, she basically developed all this technique. Then she moved to Canada to get her PhD and then came back to the US, uh, sorry, to, to England to work in the, uh, well, um, I don't remember where right now. And then when she did retire around this, uh, in this eighties, I think, she retired and became, became a yoga teacher. And she actually, during the HIV pandemic outbreak in the 90s, she came back to the lab to help people, to teach them her techniques in order to visualize viruses. So she was very determined to understand how viruses look like. Okay, so, and next. Okay, so we have the first, um, the first key term cover. I just want to clarify that right now the pandemic is caused by this coronavirus named SARS-CoV-2, and this corona that's the name of the virus, and the disease that causes is COVID-19. So you get COVID-19 where you have the virus, and the virus's name is SARS-CoV-2. Just to clarify, because it's it's kind of messy. The other thing that I want to introduce you is what is the commonality of all these viruses? So all these viruses, besides that they all cause a respiratory illness, they are also all RNA viruses. So what does that mean? It just means that they have RNA as genetic information. So I want to introduce you to a term, a term like a dogma that we have in molecular biology called central dogma of molecular biology, who was a term by Francis Crick in the 50s. Um, so basically it's explaining how the genetic information flows in, in biological systems. So as you probably all know, we store our genetic information in, as DNA, which is this, uh, Poly polymer made of nucleotides in, that it's normally in our cells, it's inside the nuclei, and it comes in a double-stranded way. So you can see it's always these double-stranded DNAs. Eh, all, eh, whenever they are talking about DNA, you see these pictures. And DNA then sends this information normally to RNA, and RNA is sort of like a similar version of DNA, but it has a dif different chemical properties. It's also a polymer of nucleotides, but most commonly you find in a single strand, it can also be double strand, but single strand in, and it makes a lot of, it has a lot of different functions in the, in the cell, but some of the function is also to make protein. So this is how information flows from DNA into RNA into protein. So the DNA and RNA process is called transcription and the RNA into protein is called translation. Also, we know that we know, and it has to happen, that DNA can replicate itself by a process called DNA replication. So it maintains itself in the future, so you can divide your cells and make more DNA and just generate like, your progeny, basically. So this is a process done by an, a specific enzyme called DNA polymerase. We're going to talk about her later, or eat later. I call enzymes, because in Spanish it's la enzima, they're always feminine for me. So uh, RNA, RNA can also replicate itself and maintain itself in time by a process called RNA replication. And also we now know that RNA can be, go back to DNA by a process called reverse transcription, which is done by another enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So this is basically the, 
the framework so I can explain to you and answer this question. How do we detect viruses? So this is also all over the news. It's very good that we go through this because, I don't know, I wake up every morning and I see some headlines saying that we need to test, test, test. So what does it mean? We need to detect the virus, and for that, we use a technique called RT-PCR. So RT-PCR stands for reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction. Okay, so that's a lot of blah. No, it doesn't mean anything, really. So I'm going to explain to you what it actually does and why, is it, why do we use it to detect the viruses. So when you have a coronavirus somewhere, what you do is just collect the sample. Like when you go and get tests, you get a, like a nasal swab or like a throat swab. You connect the sample and then you need to extract the, the genetic information inside the coronavirus. So that's an RNA molecule. So in order to do that, you need to first break the virus, basically remove the crown that it has, that is protein and lipids, and release the RNA so we can get the RNA. How do we do that? We do it with soap. So whenever you want to just remove all the crown and get the RNA, you apply soap and that it's going to dissolve, dissolve it. So that's why it's important that you wash your hands in order to kill the virus, because soap, soap actually kills the virus, it leaves the RNA um, exposed, and the RNA doesn't do anything. It dies very quickly. So this RNA, we're going to put it inside a tube in the lab. So here you have the RNA molecules. And the first step that we need to do is going to be getting this enzyme that I talked to you before, the reverse transcriptase, to work. So what does it do? It's going to transform RNA into DNA. So we put the enzyme in here, and then we wait for a little bit, and all these RNA molecules are going to become DNA by reverse transcription that I showed you before. Then this DNA, we're going to put it in another tube here, and we're going to add the second enzyme that we talk about, which is the DNA polymerase. So basically, this first part is this reverse transcriptase. So you basically do put the enzyme and transform RNA into DNA. And we're going to do the second part, which is the polymerase is going to go inside the tube. And it's going to, you basically wait for a little bit, like an hour, you let it like like sit there and put a little bit of heat. It's like cooking, basically. And this enzyme, what it's going to do, is going to replicate the pieces of DNA all the time. So this allows us that, by example, in this case, to have two viruses, and we extract one molecule of RNA, we're able to have many molecules of DNA. And this will give, give us enough resolution to see the DNA we are on uh, eyes. How do we do that? This is like a more complicated process. But to simplify, you put the DNA inside a gel, and this gel is going to have a green fluorescent molecule. And whenever the DNA interacts with the green fluorescent molecule, it's going to fluoresce a lot, and you're going to see it. So whenever you have a sample that was positive and you see the gel, you're going to see a green mark that it says it's positive. If your sample didn't have any coronavirus or any virus at all, you're not going to see anything. So that's basically the RT-PCR test that we all need to take in order to uh, detect the presence of the virus. I hope this was clear. So here we're going to introduce you to, we're going to ask you to answer this poll. So the question is, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus. In order to detect it, humans in, in humans, we use RT-PCR2. So the first uh, option is to turn virus uh, RNA into protein to see if the virus is there, is to turn RNA into DNA to see if the virus is present, and to other ways to measure RNA directly from the virus sample. So I, I'm very happy that most people are answering correctly, at least not more than 90% of the people. So people are following, this is great. Okay, so I'm gonna leave the poll. If I move the poll, it's fine, Jeannie, right here. Yeah, I can, uh, it seems like people are stopping. I'll end the poll and I'll show everybody that, okay. yeah, most of you got it right. Yeah, awesome. 
Cool. So I hope everybody understands that first the RNA inside the virus is this is we have to put it into DNA. This is critical because uh, first RNA is a very uh, like volatile molecule, so it, it it dies very quickly. DNA can stay there for longer, so we can manipulate easily. That's why you can extract DNA from like mummies and stuff like that, no? And then DNA, you can amplify the DNA to be a lot more so you can see the signal more easily than just having one or two viral samples. So this is great. Okay. Um, okay, so should I close it? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna then introduce you to the third important uh, key term is shedding of viruses through exhale breath. So whenever I'm exhaling breath, like, Okay, it's not I'm coughing, I'm just exhaling or talking like that. You can uh, throw away two kind of uh, particles. One is these respiratory droplets, which are bigger, five, like big drop, droplets of water, liquid, which are uh, larger than five micrometers. And if you see here, this picture taking a very fast uh, uh, frames per second, you can see that um, Normally when you sneeze and you cough and when you talk, you throw these big particles and they fall very rapidly into surface because they are heavy. And that's why you have to kind of clean surfaces because people are like sending these, these particles all over. And you also have these other small fine aerosol particles and these are smaller than five micrometers. And when you exhale, they can linger in the air for a very long time. No, they don't fall off. So you you have you have these kind, two different kind of particles going around. So these pictures are taken by people in the lab of Lydia Bauraiva in, at MIT, and she's doing an amazing work trying to study the dynamics of this process. So I recommend to take a look at her research. Um, okay, and the fourth key term is basically surgical face mask. So in this study, they are not gonna use the specific N95 face masks that everybody's talking about that we need because those we already know, they prevent spreading of everything that comes out of your mouth so you don't see any virus coming out. We're gonna talk about these classic surgical masks that are much cheaper, easily available. Not right now because we don't have production. But these are the ones that basically most of the people are using on the streets. And they have, a, so they are disposable, and we want to know whether they prevent the spreading of viruses, okay? So, great, I went through all the introduction. We already know what our respiratory viruses are, what is the RT-PCR technique, what are the respiratory droplets and aerosol, and also what are the surgical face masks. So now we're gonna go into the research. So the aim of this research was basically to, I divided it in two different parts. One is to investigate the importance of the respiratory droplets and aerosol on transmission of, of viruses. So the first question is whether, when I'm exhaling breath and I have these two kind of particles, do they have virus? That's it, no? The second one is see whether the efficacy of the first surgical face mask will prevent this viral transmission. So if, I'm, if I have the mask on and I exhale breath, do I spread the virus? Basically, those are the two questions, okay? So um, I know that Rocky DU you and the pre uh, other presentations, we've been covering a lot about this style scientific reasoning. So when you start, in preparing and thinking about your experiment and how to address your hypothesis and to prove it, you have different forms of um, basically go through, uh, basically different forms of how to construct your research. And in this case, this research specifically, it's, uh, it's going through under experimental evaluation. So basically they're gonna do experiments and then gonna evaluate and document what they observe in the different cases, and also they're gonna have, they are gonna be control experiments because you, you collect all the sample and the control in, and control environment that you basically control every other variable that is available, and you're only looking into one variable on itself. 
So the experimental design looks like this. First, in Hong Kong, in the hospital, they screen people who had these ARI symptoms, symptoms. So they were having the common cold. So they screened more than 3,000 individuals, and then they asked these individuals whether they wanted to participate in this research. So once you say, yes, I want to participate, they, they basically uh, screen deeply and make sure they had the specific viruses that they are studying, like the influenza, rhinovirus, coronavirus. And out of all these people screened, they selected only 246 individuals. So all of these 246 individuals are gonna go through the process of exhale breath collection. So they are gonna ask them to exhale and the scientists are gonna collect their breath sample divided into these two different particles, the droplets and the aerosol and analyze them. So half of these individuals are gonna do this by not wearing a face mask and the other half are gonna do it with the face mask. And then we're gonna do the RT-PCR on these samples and see whether they, you can find virus in the exhaled breath or you cannot find virus. This is as simple as it goes. So these are the results here. I'm gonna show you first the result for influenza virus. So for, with me, I want you to see that in the y-axis here, we have this, they are measuring the virus copies per sample, so how much RNA virus I can find on each sample through my RT-PCR. And here in the x-axis, you have all the conditions. So the first two ones are gonna be our controls. So the first one is nasal swab. So when they put a swab stick inside your nose, they collect the sample and then they're gonna analyze it for virus and you're gonna see that most of the people, oh, here, most of the people had a lot of influenza virus in, this, uh, in their noses and the same with the throat swab. So they put the swab stick inside your throat very, very deeply, they collect it and they wanna see whether they can find the virus. So most of the people have virus inside them. So then the question is whether the, you can find the virus in the exhaled breath. So first for the big droplets, when, the pe when people are not wearing masks, you can still find droplets that have virus inside them. So you here see this is a point and you see here, it, you can still find a, a, like more than, a, more than a hundred of a thousand viral copies in that sample. So that's a lot. Comparing to the people that are wearing masks, for the big droplets, you can see that you barely you only find one individual that was able to spread the virus through the mask. So this is like, it looks pretty good. So in the case of the small aerosol that can maybe go through the mask, they are able to collect for people without the mask, also virus is being shed in this form of aerosol. And with the mask, they can find a lot of people who are able to shed the virus using the mask. So this means that for influenza, it might not be such a so useful thing to use these face masks. So in the case of rhinovirus, we're gonna see here the same table, basically in the y-axis, you are measuring the viral uh, samples and in the x-axis, the, all the conditions. So here in our control, we have the nasal and the throat swab that have a lot of virus. You can see here, it's funny because rhinovirus, the one that gives you like the, the runny nose, and most of the virus is in your nose. And you can see that you can find a lot of virus in your nose compared to your throat. That's a sign note. And when they analyze the big droplets, people who are not wearing the mask, they are able to shed virus inside these deep, big droplets without a problem. Maybe it's not the same amount, but it's enough to detect it. And wearing the mask, you can still find a lot of these droplets with virus, okay? In the case of the uh, small aerosol particles, this is even more dire. So you can see here that with or without, them, uh, without or with the mask, you don't have much of a difference in the amount of viral particles you find in the aerosol drop and in, in the aerosols. So that's, this means that for rhinovirus, wearing a mask is actually not that useful to prevent the shedding of virus. 
So we're gonna go now to see the result for the coronavirus, which is our like most important virus nowadays. We all care about it. So in the case of coronavirus, again, we have the same table, the same graph here. When they measure virus copy, for example, on the y-axis and the x-axis, the different conditions they control. So in nasal and throat swab, they find a lot of virus there. Um, so these people are infected. So when they are using, when they are not using face masks, and they analyze the big droplets excel from these in uh, these individuals, you can see that they are still able to find individuals who are sh shedding the virus through the through their breath. But with the mask, they are not able to find any viral sample at all. So this is good news. In the case of the small aerosol, they also find that people without masks can shed the virus in these small aerosols. But when the, you put the mask on, this goes to zero again. So this is pretty good news, I will say. This is my opinion. So here are basically the numbers. So this is a table, how it looks like, how they present it in the paper. So if here, the first condition, you see the an analysis of the big droplets and the second condition, the analysis of the small aerosol particles. So here uh, you can see the, the rows are analy analyzing coronavirus, influenza virus, and rhinovirus. So um, as I said be before, for the coronavirus, I'm gonna go through the, the coronavirus only because that's the most important now, um, more deeply. So if you see here for the dr big droplets, you can, out of the in 10 people who didn't wear the mask, they detected that three of them were able to shed the virus on these deep droplets. And then when they put the face, when, when people have face masks, none of them were able to shed the virus through these big, big droplets. So this is meaningful. It means that wearing this mask, and if you're infected with the virus, you will prevent these droplets to come out with virus all over. So if you breathe, you will not shed these big droplets into the surface, and then people who touch those surface will not get viral particles in their hands. In the case of the small aerosol, we also see a lot of efficacy of the mask. So people who not, don't wear the mask, they found that four out of uh, 10 people, 40% were able to shed the virus through these aerosol particles. So this means that every time you breathe, you have 40% chances of just like spreading the virus to somebody and using the face mask, it goes to zero. So this is major, okay? In the case of, the other two viruses they were analyzing for the influenza virus, the masks were very effective only for to prevent the, the spread of the virus inside the big droplets comparing to the aerosol particles, the virus still goes out. And in the rhinovirus, it, seemed not to, it looks like it doesn't make any difference. So these are pretty good news for the situation that we're in right now. Okay, so with this, um, I'm gonna basically wrap it up. So what was the aim of this research? So we said it is two important uh, questions. So one uh, is basically the potential transmission of viruses through these respiratory droplets and the aerosols. And we can see that aerosol transmission is, is possible for all three viruses that we, they studied here for influenza, rhinovirus, and coronavirus. And also the second question then it's whether surgical face masks prevent the spreading of the virus through the exhaled breath. So the answer here is not yes, it's not, it's not like yes or not. It's basically, it depends on what kind of virus you are exposed to and what kind of particle you are measuring. So they were able to deduce that wearing face masks actually if you get, eh, reduces the emission of the coronavirus through both respiratory droplets and the aerosols. In the case of influenza, it was more divided because the droplets maybe are not being containing the virus, but you, they can still spread the virus through aerosol particles even wearing the face mask. And in the case of rhinovirus, it seems that it's not very useful. So I want to 
in exit the presentation and show you basically a video illustrating this. Um, so this is a video of somebody who's gonna be either not wearing a face mask and then wearing a face mask and being, his, this person is gonna be talking. And what we're gonna see is basically the aerosol particles that are being spread into the, uh, the, the air around him. So these aerosol particles are gonna basically light up in green, fluorescent green. So that's what it looks like. Now I'm recording. Hi, sorry. Stay healthy. So this person is talking Great. and you see all these virus Stay healthy. Sorry, all these particles coming out. Great. That's loud. In green. Stay healthy. So you see here, no? All of that Great. is just speed that's come out of your mouth. Now I he's wearing a mask, that. okay? Stay healthy. Louder. Stay healthy. So you see with the mask? Stay healthy. You see a few okay. particles lighting up, but they are not that many. No? Should I put it again? I think it was pretty good. And we can share the link to this if you'd like um, so that people can watch it on their own. Perfect. Yeah, so. Okay. So basically, this is all, all this research is done in in individuals in, in exhaled breath. So this is not people who are sneezing, coughing, or just like, I don't know, breathing very loudly. This is a regular breath. So if you can see here, this is a picture of, of somebody just sneezing, and the sneeze and all these aerosol particles can spread for more than seven to eight meters away from you, okay? so. This is even with the social distancing measurements that we have right now, seven to eight meters, it's a lot. We have now two meters, six feet. That's, that means that you can be spreading virus all over the place if you are sneezing, okay? So that, just to put it into perspective, if you are sick, stay home because there is no way that you can socially distance with this distance in any, unless you live in like a faraway land. 